uh, I'm very happy to stay here on the stage with uh, Lynn uh, Siegel. I met her in Barcelona in a presentation of her book. I really enjoy it, and I think I'm sure that you are going to enjoy um, because uh, the kind of speech that she is going to present that is related to her last book on radical happiness is very important for our community. Um, and she will make arguments that are very uh, helpful for uh, degrowth and envisioning our degrowth future society, I think, and the way in which I want and we want to uh, experience joy collectively, right? Uh, Lynn is an uh, Australian, but she has been living in UK uh, for a long. She's a socialist feminist, and she has many books that are important for our community. One is on masculinities, uh, plural masculinities. That was one of the best sessions that I could attend uh, during this conference. Um, and then she has also two other books that I think are interesting for, for us as the decoder. Uh, one is Making Trouble, Life and Politics, uh, in 2007 was published, and then uh, before of this last book on radical happiness, she had uh, another book that is uh, very interesting, I think, for us as a reading. Uh, was published with Verso Books as uh, Out of Time, The Pleasures and Perils of Aging. Um, so thank you to everybody to come to this closing session. I'm sure that you are going to enjoy. And Lynn, please, you are the floor. Thanks for being with us today. <laughs> Thank you for those uh, ambitious comments. I feel a little like the cuckoo in the nest, but it's lovely to be here. New to degrowth, I've really learned so much from being here, which I hope to be able to translate into my own work in future. However, I must have been invited to address you in order to talk about this book, um, Radical Happiness, Moments of Collective Joy collective joy, happiness. What an odd title for these times. It's not just here that we're worried about the future, looking at popular culture around the globe. I'm going to take this off because I think it might um, interfere with things. Oh God, we can't do it. Oh dear. I told you it would interfere. <laughs> And I told you I was a cuckoo in the nest. <laughs> so it's not just here that we're so worried about the future. Looking at popular culture around the globe, we can see that it's the profoundly dystopian imagination that is everywhere evident, as well as up here at the moment. With any form of utopic yearning all but obliterated from the fantasies of the future. Think Blade Runner. Oh my God. <laughs> A great start. Dystopian times. <laughs> Think Blade Runner, a future Los Angeles where even daylight is rationed. Hunger Games set in a wasteland where teenage Amazons compete or die. Compete and die. The Handmaid's Tale with half of the human race everywhere enslaved. And it's everyone I know is watching this. I don't watch it actually. I protect myself and censor so much. But everybody is watching these dystopian futures. They resonate with what we here all know by now. This changes everything with ever more chilling reports on climate change, water shortage, alongside our knowledge of ongoing military actions, conflict, displacement, destitution, violence around the globe, the Mediterranean chillingly carpeted almost daily with the drowned bodies of asylum seekers. On my way here, uh, I saw something from the New Yorker announcing it's a golden age, a golden age for dystopian fiction. They sell well. How ironic is that? And since the world, oh, I was going to 
use this as well. That was my book, which is just about to come out in paperback. And I'm getting on to these dystopian futures, which I thought uh, I should look up what's coming out of Europe and not just what's coming out of the States. And there too, I found dystopian fiction and film and so on everywhere. I spoke in Spain recently and I found a whole sequel of 12 dystopias for the 21st century. And I also learned from my, I thought I would look up some um, Swedish ones just to see if there were any. And of course there are. Nini Holquist, The Unit, imagining a society fixated on capital, but in the most concrete of human forms with childless women or creative types deemed dispensable, removed and forced to make their own biological contributions, having their organs harvested. Of course, this book echoes with the, what the English novelist Ishigu uh, Kazuo Ishiguru wrote a few years earlier, Never Let Me Go. And of course, we do know that people really are having their organs uh, harvested in poorer countries, having their wombs used to create babies for richer countries and so on. How many dire warnings do we need, I wonder, for us to be quite certain that at the very least, wherever we are and whoever we are, we live in all too troubling, turbulent times when so many feel more precarious than ever. Moreover, nowadays we may well feel that the specter that is haunting Europe and the rest of the world is no longer communism, as Marx and Engels declared so dramatically in their manifesto 170 years ago, but rather right-wing populism, whose most powerful representative, of course, now presides, now squats, literally, in the White House. Yet, fortunately, this is not quite the end of the matter, not yet. There are also, there are always other dynamics at play. Perhaps surprisingly, Resistance is also on the ascendancy, on the rise, confronting 40 years of global neoliberal rationality that has fueled the triumph of reactionary populism with its welfare shrinking, market triumphalism and uber individualistic frameworks. I hardly need tell you that here. It is a rationality as disdainful of collective life and our basic interdependencies, whether for care, love, and the labor of others, as on maintaining the Earth's resources on which we all rely. However, I take very seriously the words of that cultural scholar, Raymond Williams, from which my title comes, writing shortly before his death in 1988, to be truly radical is to make hope possible, rather than despair convincing. That's from his book, Resources for Hope. Thus, strange as it may seem, sometimes even to me, raising the issue of joy and collectivity in the present is just what I've tried to do in that last book of mine. But then, it's not quite so simple, since a thread throughout that book is also to insist that joy and woe are woven fine after the poet William Blake some 400 years ago. Joy, in particular, never arrives without the shadow of its loss, without a certain temporal fragility. Moreover, although the future is looking very bleak right now for so many, and indeed the long-term outlook for the human species under serious threat from climate change, we should also know that when change happens, it often arrives unexpectedly. Indeed, it is easy to show that overall, whatever our political affiliations, even for those would-be scientific Marxists, we have never been very good at predicting the future. The momentous events that begin to change the course of history usually take people by surprise. It is why we always need to hold on to a critical historical view of the present and the present's past before we try as best we can understanding the future. It is, for instance, exactly half a century, I wonder if I've got something there, exactly half a century since that iconic upheaval, May 68, 
back then in the Western world, apart from Franco's Spain and Salazar's authoritarian dictatorship in Portugal, there was a sudden rise of collective resistance, shared joy and utopian yearning. We shall fight, we shall win Paris, London, Rome, Berlin, as the UK radical magazine Black Dwarf declared, headed up by our best known 60s radical Tariq Ali. Form dream committees, demand the impossible, etc., with a situationist inspired slogans daubing the walls in Paris as General de Gaulle fled the city fe fearing full scale revolution, as briefly it was in the grip of students and workers together in joyful revolt, confidently demanding, it's interesting to know what they were demanding, self management by workers. Decentralization of economic and political power alongside participatory democracy at the grassroots. All they were wanting, these street fighting rebels, was an end to exploitative capitalist working conditions, to pointless consumerism, to American imperialism, and especially an end to Vietnam War and the military industrial complex. Now, ironically, the lasting legacies of May 68 mostly did not involve that street fighting man who had shouted so fiercely from the barricades, but rather the rapid growth of women's liberation alongside many other movement struggles and community activism. Most of it totally unforeseen by leading 68ers. Here we come. Interestingly, the two decades immediately preceding 1968 had been, for the most part, the most quiescent and conformist in Europe and the Western world, with people retreating into domesticity and the accelerating consumerism we know so well of post-war retrenchment. Indeed, post-45, the best-known public intellectuals broadcast their view that democracy and utopian thinking of any kind were incompatible. The latter declared both impossible and dangerous. Thus, the most influential European emigre, British philosopher Karl Popper, argued in his classic essay, Utopia and Violence, that while they, utopia may look desirable, all too desirable, it was in practice a dangerous and a pernicious idea. It was self-defeating and it could lead only to violence. It was said to be a form of totalitarian logic a chief accusation of the Cold War used by Western propagandists to see off any criticism of, capitalist, of capitalism or talk of communism. However, as Walter Benjamin once wrote, nothing that has ever happened should be regarded as lost for history, a thought sometimes recalled by those of us refusing to despair of better times to come. Almost a century before, Exactly, you see, I have a lot of exact dates coming up. You see, 68, 1868 comes up. Almost exactly a, a century before, there had been the Paris Commune of 1871, which, though ending in bloody defeat after only two months, was the very first time workers took power and would spread radical visions for workers' control and democratic self-government around the world. The ideas that motivated its militants, men and very often women alike, had been building for over 20 years, as Kristen Ross discusses in her instructive book, Communal Luxury, the Political Imaginary of the Paris Commune. As Ross explains, Louise Michel was just one of the most illustrious women who had played a large, large part in preparing for and supporting the Commune, <coughs> in organizing debating clubs that, that thrived from 1868, in involving both pedagogy and entertainment, and through the influential women's union that brought together workers in the garment and other trades. No vote yet, but still women were organizing. While it lasted, the commune adopted equal pay for male and female teachers, and also made significant changes in education for both children and adults, <coughs> so that more workers could become teachers thereby breaking down the divisions of labor between manual and intellectual workers. Something still to come. Thus, although dystopian scenarios came to dominate speculation about the future as the 20th century progressed, closing with the talk 
now of end times, of the destruction of humanity. It all began very differently and was interpret <coughs> interrupted by many high times of hope and joy. The late 19th and early 20th century um, had generated diverse utopian yearnings for moving beyond the cruelties of early capitalism with its inevitable class struggle and murderous imperial rivalry. <coughs> These visions were influential before being beaten back by the carnage of imperial rivalry of the First World War. In the USA, <coughs> it was the technocratic Edward Bellamy's best-selling science fiction looking back <coughs> Imagining the world we are in now, post-2000, it would be exactly the opposite as it, of what it is. It would be one in which the state had gained control of the reins of technological growth, taking over the corporations to create an egalitarian utopia. This meant huge improvements in housing, in public resources, as well as in workers' conditions, with everyone retiring to pursue their own interests by the age of 45. Shorter working time is actually in every utopia, going right back to um, Plato. <coughs> this is, of course, exactly the reverse of what has happened in our time, with corporations now holding sway over nation states, especially in the USA, and almost all public spaces in the hands of private capital. Yet for a while, Bellamy's vision relying upon strengthening state controls over working conditions and environment did feed into some of the grander municipal, architectural and public housing projects of the late 19th and early 20th century, not only in the US, but in Britain and uh, other parts. I seem to have uh, something else here. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I haven't got to that yet. Um, <coughs> In Britain, uh, the most influential utopian thinker was William Morris, rather the opposite of Bellamy, not being a technocrat. Like all radicals of his day, however, Morris was appalled by the squalor and miseries of 19th century industrialism, prompting him to write his own classic utopian novel, News from Nowhere, serialised throughout the 1890s. Here, his narrator has a dream in which cities have turned green again, with federations of skilled craftsmen having <coughs> created federalized communities filled with public gardens, markets, and communal meeting places. The book concludes by suggesting if only others could see the future as he had, then this dream would become a vision of the possible, not a dream. And let me tell you, unlike Bellamy, Morris would have loved degrowth and he said that the Houses of Parliament at Westminster would make a very good place for storing manure. So <coughs> it was the maverick Marxist historian E.P. Thompson who did most to put William Morris back on left agendas in recent times, arguing for a new alliance between socialism and utopianism, later using the early work of French philosopher Miguel Abensor to stress his continuing significance it was a Bensor who coined the memorable phrase, the education of desire, to suggest that what Morris offered was not any concrete blueprint for the future, but rather, like most utopian thinkers today, what he offered was to liberate desire by questioning all existing values. He wanted to teach desire to desire, to desire better, to desire more, more or less, and above all, to desire in a different way. Thompson repeated Marx's warning that if workers were educated only to heed the contradictions and destructiveness of capitalism, then apart from their engagement with the bitter, pr bitter praxis of class struggle, they were always likely to fall back on the ruling ideas of the moment. It is the lack of any interest in discussing the details of the future in the later Marxist tradition, the Leninist tradition, Thompson declared those dead, dead men walking, that resulted in the significant failings of the Marxist imagination itself, its lack of moral self-consciousness or even a vocabulary of desire, its inability to project any images of the future, and its tendency to fall back in lieu of these upon the util utilitarian's earthly paradise 
the maximization of economic growth. You know all about that. Yeah. What a pity, Thompson, a rather silver-tongued orator, is not here to perform on degrowth platforms today. Meanwhile, Morris was far from alone in trying to broaden socialist visions of the future as the 20th century dawned. Edward Carpenter, later known as the sexy sage of Sheffield, was both practicing and tirelessly promoting his vision of an alternative culture and way of life, which would be, again, more egalitarian, where people live simply, where they live closer to nature and to other creatures. Happily homosexual, despite its illegality and an increase, actually, in um, the jailing of homosexuals from the jailing of Oscar Wilde, Carpenter kept on arguing for enlarging the sphere of love, sexual freedom, and women's emancipation, all conditions existing <coughs> in his own open and welcoming living arrangements at Millthorpe while writing Love's Coming of Age. In my, dreams and in my Days and Dreams, another book, Carpenter sketched his view of how people could build the alternative, inclusive culture he cherished, denouncing the widespread contempt for manual labor, the hypocrisies of religion, the disdain for pleasures of the body, and men's control over women. As British feminist Sheila Rowbottom notes in her illuminating biography, Carpenter em Carpenter's emphasis on the life of desire angered many male socialists of his day and after, as George Orwell, eager to defend proletarian manliness against what he saw as the pious dreams of those with their vegetarian smell who go about spreading sp sweetness and light. Rather like Edward Thompson a generation earlier, Rowbottom concludes that t Carpenter's tussles over how to create a new culture within the old without falling into prescription, how to establish collectivities which allow space for the personal and the spiritual of individuals are of contemporary and not just historical interest. I hardly need tell you that. Meanwhile, Rowbottom was also busy researching and educating us about the forgotten feminist visionaries back then, whose past footprints are always so easily erased. Her book, Dreamers of a New Day, resurrects women who, from the 1880s up to the First World War, that catastrophe that stifled these hopes, challenged all existing assumptions around sex and gender, this was the era of first wave feminism with its renowned struggle for women's rights to vote. However, much else was stirring in Britain militant trade union feminists, such as the factory worker Ada Neil Chu, was campaigning for the eight hour day and writing to her local paper that factory women needed time to read and to enjoy nature. We cannot be said to live, she wrote. We merely exist. A living wage, Ours is a lingering, dying wage. Nice words. Women from all classes a century ago for a while, were for a while broadening their vision of women's emancipation beyond the struggle for the vote into imagining comprehensive social transformation in all spheres, including their domestic and sexual lives. Some were cam campaigning for the expansion of municipal socialism, like uh, Jane Clapperton writing her own feminist visions for communal buildings with shared kitchens, nursery schools, and cultural facilities, spaces for private quarters, and so on. Many other things were happening, which I won't have time to go into. They were also happening in the USA, although travel was difficult. Uh, communication between various parts of Europe and the US was very active uh, and activists in Britain were aware of what their American sisters were up to, including those campaigning against racial prejudice, slavery, <coughs> and so on. For instance, the eloquent oratory of that black um, uh, activist Ida B. Wells. When women took to the streets to demand an eight-hour day over there, the Chicago Tribune reported that despite their worn faces and threadbare clothing, they shouted and sang and laughed in a whirlwind of exuberance. And such energy and shared joy has regularly accompanied collective action for better lives. 
thus the successful three-month strike for better wages at the Lawrence Textile Factory in Massachusetts in 1912 became iconic for its banners thought to be carried by its mostly immigrant women activists. We want bread, but we want roses too. Those banners apparently didn't exist, which has done nothing to undermine their joyful resonance for feminists down the years. Another utopian echo, some of you, will like and know is that attributed to the anarchist feminist Emma Goldman, if there is no dancing at the revolution, I'm not coming. These were not her precise words either, although we can trace their source to her autobiography, Living My Life, where she insisted that it was important to try to live your desired futures in the present, whatever the obstacles. Goldman angrily rejected criticism she had received from an anarchist comrade who thought her energetic dancing frivolous by endorsing everybody's right to beautiful, radiant things. The pioneering feminist Charlotte Perkins Gilman published her own fiction, Her Land, in 1915, again illustrating a world of women combining work and community engagement with the joys of motherhood. Gilman and other radical women also called for public provision for housing to enable forms of cooperative living, to enable house home crafts to develop in large apartments with swimming pools, tennis courts, and dance halls for that energetic dancing. These earlier dreamers saw their differing utopian yearnings submer submerged by the First World War and the Depression following it in the 1930s. But as Rowbottom rightly concludes from women's past and still ongoing battles, trying to bridge the personal and the political quite as hard today as ever different but equally hard, there is no automatic accretion of improvement, but only the need to reinvent utopia in every era, indeed. I said already that the women's liberation movement proved itself the first main beneficiary of 60s radicalism. The protests of its closing years were critical for women's renaissance and the renewal of our utopian yearnings in 68. 68 was the year that the US movement staged its first widely reported protest. Interestingly, the American pageant throwing useless waste like uh, bras, etc., into a bin. It was also the year Adrian Rich wrote her poem, Planetarium, A Woman in the Shape of a Monster. A monster in the shape of a woman. The skies are full of them. And so they were. Suddenly, it was raining women. Had much more to say here, but no time. It was the 60s emphasis on culture and personal identity that led to the exuberant rise of movement politics generally. At a time of greater sexual freedom, it was feminists pondering anew the nature of women's bodies, desires, motherhood, and general caring role, something which has got only worse in today's uh, neoliberal present, that really brought personal life into politics, though at first entangled always with a collectivist vision, not an individualist vision involving shared resources. Moreover, for a few years, there really was ongoing, there really was, um, something was ongoing, anyway, <laughs> um, progress on every front and in particular an expansion of those community resources and of community resistance alongside the blossoming of feminist cultural life. Jam Today was the name of our favorite feminist band, capturing the high hopes of the 70s women's movement. This was in Britain. We might still be lacking in confidence, most of us were, but feminists were not lacking in hope at times sharing the miraculous revolutionary power of joy. Ellen Willis wrote that from the US. When uniting to combat inequalities and oppression by whatever means, whatever peaceful means, we could muster. It's the lasting significance of those years that have helped many an aging feminist like me keep a certain political optimism alive, whatever the gloom we feel about the present as I describe in that political memoir, Making Trouble. However, as we know, something else was stirring alongside 
the optimism in the heyday of feminism that we didn't foresee, with inflation rising and recession looming. What have I got next? Oh, yes, that's more on the heyday of feminism. And that's me with a cigarette, which I tell my doctors I've never smoked. But there's the evidence for everybody. <laughs> and I don't think it's even a joint. <laughs> um, um, with inflation rising and recession looming in the late 70s, the right was also on the rise. Uh, and here in the UK, sorry, home in the UK, as in the USA, it was not just class war back on the agenda with a vengeance following the election of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, but a comprehensive cultural assault on all notions of equality and collective solidarity. And with economic survival more precarious, the social networks sustaining progressive practice often withered. We usually had ways of surviving better without making too many compromises outside of our radical activities back in the 70s. That became impossible with all the attacks um, on um, livelihoods from the 80s onwards. Individual striving, not collectivity, was the new watchwords of what near of what's now called neoliberal rationality, with weakness and vulnerability repackaged as pathology, dependence as shameful, ruthless competitiveness imposed upon public and private sector alike, with all those false, bizarre metrics for um, pretending that they're measuring both in terms of education or health and so on. So I'm now back full circle to the present, with every fiction writer honing their skills on writing those dystopias, such as the one I just mentioned, Ishiguru, Never Let Me Go, where disposable people are now being bred simply for their body parts. And uh, as I've mentioned, we, we see the beginnings of that today with the use of women's bodies in particular around the world and people having to sell their organs for money just to survive or support those they love. Ironically, however, with distrust of the future rampant, our governments have been busy measuring happiness. Happiness. Indeed, happiness and well-being became the key watchwords for governments in the 1990s around the world. Yet who knows what was being measured when social context is ignored and happiness is seen as some type of inner attribute we just uh, can be, which can be measured, um, which we're all told to grow, which we all need to express to keep that smile on our face. So much is suppressed in current talk of happiness, not just the hidden coerciveness that means we're all now expected to display that smiley face, which um, we have to grow, <coughs> Um, um, especially in our jobs, however precarious and however grinding their nature. In reality, what's being hidden by talk of happiness is the soaring rates of crippling depression and chronic anxiety around the globe, which we do also know about. It's said to affect one in six of us, actually one in four for women over 40, and highly correlated with the effects of structural inequality, completely correlated with that. For certain, this keeps the pharmaceutical companies smiling, but it's a cruel fate for the spiraling hordes of people now urged to heal themselves by the fastest means possible, usually cognitive uh, therapy, getting the right attitudes. I am happy, I can smile, I will smile. This is why, in my latest book, I suggest that happiness is not best seen as some inner quantifiable state, detached from the world around us, but rather as a way of acting in the world, a type of energy, that's a sort of Spinozian language, that attaches us to life, an energy that attaches us to life, doing things that seem meaningful, that seem important to us. Most of us are not doing that much of the time. For, for we are never truly outside of the social, even when solitary or turning inwards in meditation and aesthetic enjoyment. I say a lot about that when we imagine we're just all alone by ourselves. We're never simply that. We're dependent hugely on everybody around us. 
often when we think we're most alone and most separate on some cliff face or hill somewhere. Yet in today's precarious world, <coughs> so many are removed from that possibility when feeling alone and happy of uh, just being able to be in beautiful situations. Thus, in my book, I've got a lot to say about what we mean, what we might call public happiness, which was a term used by the political philosopher Hannah Arendt, by which she meant the opportunities created within any society for people to move outside their own personal concerns, happy or miserable, into some conscious participation. Oh, I had statistics on depression there. Uh, into some conscious participation in public life, culture, and politics. In her view, it was here that people, whoever they were, should be able to engage collectively in the affairs of the day, a bit like the Athenian city, the demos in the Athenian city-state, each person being respected as poten potential agents in the world at large. Indeed, for Arendt, some political engagement was necessary, completely necessary, to sustain a happy and healthy society, and vice versa. Adrian Rich, that um, <coughs> well-known American poet and activist and feminist, also spoke of radical happiness, that's where I got my title from, radical happiness, to describe moments of shared joy, which she described feeling in joyful political engagement, particularly, for instance, when she went to Seattle in 1999, seeing everybody there out on the street, another world is possible, or when she went to Chile to read her poetry with the end of Pinochet. So I can illustrate a few. Uh, oh, well, you know where that is. That's in Spain, and that's um, the five million people that took part in the feminist strike on the 8th of March in 2018. Perhaps a little mixed with certain things we may or may not all approve of around uh, <coughs> independence for that region, because I think this is from, not Barcelona, but um, somewhere above Barcelona. Um, this is uh, me in London with a colleague. Um, uh, campaigning for better housing. This is dancing in the streets in Taksim Square in Turkey where they were sending poisonous gas out. No, we're not going to stop resisting. They put on their gas masks and they kept on dancing in Taksim Square at least for a while. Um, so, as you can see from these, as I've said, whatever our fears of the future, a spirit of resistance to this, the disorders of the present has never entirely disappeared, even over recent decades, but rises and falls as circumstances allow. The last decade has indeed been nightmarish for many, yet it's also been a time of growth and new forms of resistance against obscene inequality, military violence, displacement, and the dispossession of so many, usually caused by Western wars or famine from other types of um, <coughs> uh, new forms of imperialism, Western imperialism, resource imperialism. Of course, we saw this spectacularly in the popular uprisings as bringing millions onto the streets as here in the Arab Spring in 2011 and in the occupation of city squares in most of the Western metropolis from um, London to New York to uh, Australia and uh, certainly very much across Europe in, in um, Greece, Spain, Portugal and so on as well as the continuing eruption of battles against austerity and the corporate invasion of public spaces alongside refurbished queer and trans politics. It's that um, corporate takeover of public spaces which makes resistance a lot harder today than in the days when there really was more possibility of take going into our parks, which are uh, in Britain and I'm sure elsewhere, being sold off, being, you know, literally, you know, the proposals in Britain have been to build um, new parks and so on that are far more open 
to corporate capital and their display of their resources than to the people coming into them. That was Boris Johnson's idea for the Millennium Bridge, which um, uh, they spent millions, hundreds of millions on before they realized that it was an idiotic idea and couldn't proceed. And you weren't even allowed to walk across this bridge without special, um, I don't know, passports or something. And of course, we've all seen a rising concern, as you all know here, with green politics, biodiversity, our knowledge of how much um, uh, uh, species uh, death there's been over recent years, each and every day, and concern with the sustainability of life on Earth and all the attempts we know of and that so many of you have talked of here to create more sustainable lives in the here and now. That's practical utopias in the here and now, which really are going on in lots of places. The question is, how can they endure? More than ever, it remains clear to me that we need constant reinforcement of those spontaneous or enduring forms of movement politics, echoing again all those spontaneous movements I've just looked at from the past that have been erupting probably from the beginning of time anyway, from the beginning of capitalist exploitation. And of course we know that is in the context of greater immiseration, however, that that context has also helped propel a populist right into the heart of government in recent elections, near and far here. Hopefully not in the next election, um, but certainly um, in uh, Britain, the US, Hungary, and so many, uh, India, and so many other places, while feeding the Brexit vote in Britain as some politicians fan recressive forces of racism, misogyny, and xenophobia in what the Indian writer Pranka Mishra sums up as the counter-democracy of the aggrieved. It's the counter-democracy, all those aggrieved and resentful people who think if we can just, we heard it yesterday, get rid of the migrants, get rid of every force we're going to declare alien, then all will be well and we can sail into the future uh, with our country's great again. This is why it's long been my view that it's equally important to keep seeking out the broadest possible progressive alliances and solidarities wherever they can be found, both in the alternative spaces and crevices of resistance, however quirky, I could give examples of that, and also in the institutionalized mainstream of parliamentary and trade union politics, whatever left parties there are, which have any possibility of getting their hands on the levers of power. Whichever ones then are trying to deliver the most progressive forms of government possible, which expand those crevices and spaces for alternative activities. The future looks bleak for troublemakers of any age, yet I'm hardly the first person to note how quickly we can oscillate between despair and occasional delight, fear and rage as we face the worsening situation for so many with solidarity alone generating that defiant sense of hope, agency and belonging when we manage to fight for change. And here, when I have more time, I often quote some of the work of John Berger, particularly when he went to Palestine and talked about um, living in the rubble that's been created by um, <coughs> Israeli occupation, a rubble of <coughs> a rubble of space, but a rubble of words where it's becoming almost impossible to uh, fight the militant Zionist expansionism and still wanting to talk of hope. What is genuinely exciting about this moment is that despite and also because of the shared anxieties of the election of a reactionary populace as leader of the self-styled free world, I sense a passionate interest in understanding quite how this hideous thing has happened. There is today a great engage greater engagement in politics than I have witnessed for a very long time. And that too takes me back to the heyday of movement politics, to utopian longings, 
to solidarity and to resistance. In Radical Happiness, I also note that we sometimes renew our attachment to life by embracing its sorrows, by embracing both its real sorrows alongside the possible joys of collectivity, confronting troubles far larger than our own. Again, that takes us back to Hannah Arendt as well. As Judith Butler stresses, it is recognizing our common injurability that can, cr can bring us together and one way and another, simply being together in moments of collective resistance helps to ground us in the world, to ground us in hope. That gives us a heightened sense of being alive, of crossing generational and other divides. That's me in a few years' time. Um, <coughs> um, I don't know, oh yes, I don't know which Occupy that is, probably somewhere in New York. Yeah, I know, I'm, I've only got a few sentences. That's also, in times of collectivity and resistance, when the psyche can sometimes relax for a while from its competitive um, <coughs> uh, struggle to always show that happy face, from those selfies that we have to put on Facebook or elsewhere, from uh, monitoring our actions at all times to see if we're going to be able to get that job or whatever, the sort of things that Barbara Ehrenreich has written so well in books like Smile or Die. It's when, as Freud has said, we might escape that gloomy tyrant of the self. The self looms so large, ever larger today. How do we escape it? Well, one way of escaping it is in collective struggle. Equality, solidarity, care and commitment were the values early feminists once tried to live by, explicitly rejecting the commodified life enshrining consumption, competition and ubiquitous subservience to corporate market interests that try to rule us today. So that is the ut utopian yearning I sometimes see repositioned today and see repositioned everywhere on every seat here, of course, for it's clear to many that some form of utopian spirit envisaging a more caring, greener, sustainable world rather than one in thrall to the mindless motors of growth is now simply essential for us to have any tolerable future or perhaps any future at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn, for your inspiring uh, speech. I think this, um, taking this ambiguous relation between joy and soreness is very important. And again, a shame away from the self and um, go uh, towards the collective joy is a very important debate that we should have. And uh, today we have at least half an hour for embracing this debate with Lynn. And so I will start to collect questions and comments. One over there, two, okay, and three. Okay, perfect. Over there, there is a microphone. Is it this only microphone that we have? No, well, I can't, don't worry. <laughs> so if it must. Thanks, um, and thank you too for this very inspiring talk. Um, I wanted to ask you if, like, this critique on happiness you, you presented. Wave the hand up? I'm here. Oh, all right. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, this critique of happiness that you presented. Do you think it also applies to hope? Because I feel sometimes we force ourselves too much to be hopeful, you know, and then create some weird illusions we need to have in order to be hopeful enough to get up in the morning but those illusions kind of don't help our movement to find like the right directions of things. Yeah, that's my question. Help me, who, are, who were the other? Sorry, who raised the hand before? Ah, sorry. Yeah. 
Is someone else asking a question? Yeah, just a quick yeah. one um, yeah. for Lynn and maybe Sorry. from other people in the room. Um, I absorbed The Hunger Games and all the dystopian fiction. Um, can I get some recommendations on some utopian fiction I should also be consuming? <laughs> and the last one of this round, Lynn, uh, who's over there, right? Yes, there, can you? Thank you. Um, I wondered, Lynn, in, in your research, your work, and your thinking, um, can you raise hi, <laughs> whether you were interested in um, ways of coming together and, and community action that, in a sense, weren't about resistance, potentially, that, that weren't uh, oppositional, but actually were, <laughs> yeah, just in, in a sense of the... Uh, the decreasing number of ways in which we seem to be able to come together communally and are becoming more individuated, um, or whether you feel that resistance is sort of the inherent way in which that seems to occur. Thank All you. right. Okay. Um, I'm not saying for the first question, <laughs> we all have to feel hopeful. I am saying that... Um, we can renew our sense of being alive by looking around and embracing its suffering and challenges and difficulties um, as much as you know going to a concert or dancing. I'm saying um, so. I'm not. I'm not. I think your question relates to a notion of individual hope. How do I get out of bed in the morning? Well. I'd hope, for instance, your comrades and friends might drag you out <laughs> when you're depressed and uh, certainly not tell you off, how can you be so miserable and the rest of the world is even more miserable and we're all headed for disaster, I agree. Um, uh, that sort of um, hectoring won't do. But what I think is, if you manage to get out <laughs> of bed in the morning, uh, then that energy, that life energy, is something that makes life more livable. And um, <coughs> uh, for instance, there's uh, one famous, one, sorry, one well-known um, activist group in Britain is called Sisters Uncut. Many of them black women, uh, working class women, all of them who've been, or nearly all of them have been abused and in situations of violence, so, you know, all alone with certainly no reason to get out of bed in the morning except they have to because their babies are wailing and so on. But then, you know, when and if they manage somehow to find other women in their situation, then um, suddenly <laughs> they're the ones that have been leading sort of resistance at the moment and occupying bridges and putting... Uh, banners over those bridges um, demanding more resources, better housing and so on for uh, women to escape uh, intolerable living situations. So the sort of hope that I'm talking about is trying to stay attached to life, how, however despairing that can seem. That's why I referenced John Berger, by the way, oh, that comes to the last question. So that, that's what I'm talking about. Not Oh, I still feel hopeful. No, something together. Perhaps we can try to do something about all the things that we think are so wrong and why we don't think we've got reason to get up in the morning. Right. Um, well, in, uh, in this book, I have two chapters, actually, on utopian fiction. There's a lot of it. I mean, you know, going back to um, uh, Plato's um, uh, Republic and... Uh, you know, uh, Thomas More, it was his, it was 200 years since uh, his book, Utopia, that's when the word was first used in Britain. And, you know, on to all those people, I said, um, uh, William Morris, I, I, of course, I'm sorry, I'm very um, uh, <coughs> Anglo-American uh, focused, Australian a little, but I don't, I would have to do a lot more work to know what the uh, utopian fiction might be in the rest of the world, but so you would have to do more of that. And there's also now a huge secondary literature on utopias, which is very, very interesting, um, that begins from dismissing 
the idea that uh, utopian thinking is frivolous um, 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 fountains producing money or honey or something like that. It is about um, something that is thinking through how we can live better lives and often now practical utopias or what I think it was Foucault called heterodox spaces, just creating those spaces, which I'm sure most of you do know something about for creating different ways of living in the here and now. And, and the possibilities for that then, as the last questioner pointed out, uh, have been absolutely decreasing by the market simply marching in to places where it never seemed to be in the past, you know, literally, you know, into um, family, child raising. The next book that I hope to write is going to be on care, but really all my books are exactly the same. They're all arguments for socialist feminism. So the book on care, which I hope will be called Lean on Me, Disavows of Dependency, is precisely about the fact that the most basic and elementary things are being rendered almost impossible, such as caring for our kids. Now, that was the, the struggle that brought women's liberation into existence. Many of us were mothers. Many of us, I mean, of course, we wanted sexual freedom and we wanted, you know, all sorts of things, but it was very much thinking about who cares for the children. That's what <coughs> led to uh, many of the fighting for resources that for a few years uh, we fought for and won. Now, it's extraordinary to me Everyone tells me um, that it's getting harder than ever simply to raise a child because mothers cannot, they can neither depend on the state for any support nor is there any sort of breadwinner wage for support. And so, and particularly in places like the USA, when they have to be looking after their children all the time, and yet with the attack on single mothers and so on, they have to be out there in work all the time. Um, that's what Erin wrote, wrote about in her book, Nickel or Dime. They are in a hopeless and impossible situation. There's a book called um, uh, Parenting in Precarious Times and Mothering the Crisis, a whole lot of books that are pointed as impossibility, simply, of doing childcare. And also, as childcare itself gets commodified, as it's being paid for to allow women to stay in the workforce in those longer hours, unless they're married to billionaires, of course, to keep a home over their heads, they're importing usually other women from the third world at minimum, if any, wages to do their own housework and caring, uh, or for the men, since they haven't even got time to look for partners for uh, their sexual activities in, in, in the sex work trade. And so, you know, every aspect of life is being commodified. And I've forgotten the question. The question is spaces. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it is harder today. We've got an even more basic fight. But, you know, more people are becoming aware of this. And so we're going to have to not just go back to where we were in the 70s fighting for uh, a different way of care and caring and parenting. And now, of course, this huge uh, alarm, a tsunami of caring for the elderly that um, you know people are so terrified of, and our politicians are dealing with that by turning it, trying to turn us against the aging population and sort of they you know it's a bit like these books never let me go and so on. You know, well, their body parts perhaps can be harvested, our, our kidneys and livers can be recycled or something, but for heaven's sake, do we really have to look after these dementing oldies? Martin Amos, um, <coughs> one of our best-known writers, talked about the tsunami of ageing that's coming where old people are going to be stinking up the streets, uh, you know, and he proposes something which is actually a proposal that goes, has been coming and going over the centuries, that at 70, he's, by the way, over 70, um, we can have these um, pillar boxes or some boxes on every street where we uh, uh, shake the hands and give someone a medal and kill them off so we won't have to demand that the state look after them. 
And this is what I talk a lot about in my book, Out of Time, saying the idiocy of this. It's as though caring work is something that nobody wants to do. And it's as though we're not interdependent. It's as though we won't all get old. On the one hand, we have to have babies. On the other hand, we're all going to, if there's to be any future for humanity, on the other hand, we're all going to get old. We have to simply start rethinking bottom up uh, how to live, which begins from these issues of social reproduction. So that's why I think feminism, you know, along with degrowth and so on, again, as I don't have to tell you here, it's just going to be so important. And those, you know, we're probably not meant to be in those spaces now. We have to get a license to hold a protest in the park or something. We just have to go there, don't we? And if there's enough of us, then um, what are they going to do? Well, what are they going to do? They're going to start gassing us and, and so on. But then we dance and put on those masks. And I can leave it to you young people to do that. <laughs> No, I'll be there. <laughs> Another you round? You can see I'll be there. Another round? Two, three, four. Okay, two over there and one here and then... Okay. Lawrence. Um, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, feminist oh, analysis, yeah, and I've learned again more about that. Um, one uh, factor I'm interested in is also um, if you can comment about the religion factor as well, mm. especially for women, because obviously that's a tricky game mm. with organized church, which often in the history has oppressed women. Um, but on the other hand, women throughout the history in Europe, which is having the most popular religion still, Christianity, have been uh, women as the uh, parts that were reproducing the, the spiritual beliefs of the society through education of, of children and so on. Um, so how do you reflect on that tricky uh, dilemma of, on one hand, a very patriarchal church, which is oppressing especially women with not giving it full gender equality, but on the other hand, Christianity, with all its values, not lying very far from degrowth with ascetic living, modesty, sharing, communal sharing, and, and so on and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very fascinating talk. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Aisha I'm at Stockholm University. Uh, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. At another time, uh, I looked into the utopias that you mentioned as well. And one of the things that I have noticed was the similarity between William Morris, Edward Bellamy, H.G. Wells' times, um, in that whenever there was antagonism, in these utopias, it was covered over. There was no suggestion of how we would deal with antagonisms after the utopia took place. So I would like to ask whether you have any suggestions over how we should approach this subject and also advertise a little bit whether uh, if any, anyone uh, here is coming to the European ISA conference, there will be two sessions on feminism, technology, and utopias that is organized by Laura Horn from Ros Roskilde University. Perhaps some of these ideas can be also discussed there. If you happen to be there, please join us. Thank you. Hello. So uh, <clears throat> I want to develop like a little, a little bit uh, and a little bit different. Well, I, I love to dance uh, like Emma Goldman uh, all night, like uh, like crazy and so on. But I, there's one uh, one issue is that well, I find that okay, there's the growth narrative. There is like uh, extreme right coming. Um, but I think there's also a narrative within us, which is uh, that we're only a very small minority. On uh, on. If we're the only one that are aware, a few aware are like profiting from the system, and we're completely stuck in the institution. And then the only thing we could do would be to party like crazy, um, 
<laughs> like going to like uh, going do down on the Titanic. Do do get on the Titanic and on, on, on dance on the Titanic like crazy and destroy like get completely uh, f uh, drunk on uh, on 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 like use a lot of resources in our parties and so on like uh, I don't know on destroy all the sur surpluses go to do auto da phase of uh, of burning men and so on and mm. I, I don't know I, I don't. I don't. I, I think we're better to do with celebrating our diversity and on, 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 on building really uh, motivating narrative on partying all the time, but without wasting resources. Like. Uh. Okay. Thank you. Well, they're Le all such good questions. Le all the things Lin I. Oh. I, I would like to have another round after, so try to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh yes, I talk for too long. Don't know. You can tell me no, to no, be no. quiet. Um, <laughs> When I was writing Where is Joy, chapter three of this book, I discovered, interestingly, that joy sort of begins with the churches. And joy originally comes from a sense of being closer to God. That, you know, that's when the Christian feels joyful. Actually, a bit different for the Jew. I'm a Jew um, um, of a sort. Um, <laughs> very secular. <laughs> um, and uh, so... I, and a lot of people have said, um, if you don't have God, you can't really be joyful. And certainly it was in within the churches that um, people could relax. And particularly, uh, actually, the churches of so-called oppressed, you know, black churches in, in, in the U.S. and so on, that you would have your dancing and stomping of feet and, you know, rhetoric to, to get a sort of festival of happiness on the move. And... Um, I take that uh, very seriously, and there are various philosophical arguments, usually from Christian philosophers, saying that without God, you can't really have much joy or much hope in the future. I've just for a moment forgotten the name of the philosopher arguing that, <coughs> um, but it's an argument around secularism and Christianity. And what I think now is politics is always a messy business. Everything is a messy business. Everything is paradoxical and contradictory, actually. And, you know, communism is a religion. Degrowth is a religion in the sense of it becomes a faith that we believe in, that we put our hopes in. You know, we've got no proof that we're going to be able to, you know, that what we hope for will come about or how we see the world is absolutely the right way of seeing the world. So I don't think there is this big distinction between... Um, secular coming together and religious coming together. And that's what we've seen with the mothers of the disappeared and so on. Feminists have always had to face this. For someone like me who usually comes into politics objecting to how I'm being placed by the identity politics that is placing me as a woman or as a whatever, as a Jew, um, I'm usually saying, no, I'm not that and I'm not that. And, and, and that's what then I find, together with other people, a new way of being which does become almost, you could say, a new type of religion. It's, I think a religion is actually a politics of hope. God, the belief in God, for heaven's sake, you know, what could be more utopian than, than that, to think there's some God somewhere who's going to make everything all right. That's a complete utopia, isn't it? So, so therefore, all one can fight for is uh, other types of uh, less patriarchal and egalitarian, less institutionalized forms of religion. I mean, the Kurdish religion, for instance, was one of the most patriarchal and oppressive that I've ever heard of. And yet, the, it's the Kurdish women who are the leading uh, pe re people leading resistance in Turkey and who've, of course, been hugely <coughs> empowered, if you know those women from Rahavia and so on, in, in fighting for a be better world. So I think, you know, one always teases out the contradictions and sees then uh, the ways in which um, religion can be made compatible and is compatible and is a part of politics. On um, antagonisms within um, these uh, utopias in the here and now, that's a very, very real thing because um, we know that all solidarities, all group identities can easily congeal into a type of prescriptiveness and preaching and this is how you've got to be you know some people would say of um, the heyday of feminism where you know we thought we were open to women everywhere you know black 
white, whatever, whatever, um, old, young, big, little, you know. Uh, and people say, well, well, actually, unless you're wearing jeans and <laughs> short hair, you're not going to be welcome. <laughs> you know, we feel out of place. You know, so everyone tends to get their uniforms and way of presenting themselves in the world. And I think now, particularly since the critiques of identity politics and so on, we can think more about uh, the dangers of how, you know, you have to create certain forms of uh, uh, hopefully open identities, but it's always hard for them to be open enough, and we always simply have to be, try and be self-critical about that. Not, not, not self-critical in the sense of, oh, we're so guilty because, you know, too many of us are white and so on, but um, too many of us are too well-educated or whatever, but saying, yeah, this is an issue. You know, how are we going to try and deal with it? And how to be open to the world, or always that, how to be open to the world. Uh, but it's a very real problem, you know, and, and certainly, you know, feminism was torn apart by factionalism as almost every left group has been torn apart by factionalism and so on. All we can do is be aware of it and try and transcend that. And I, I actually think the extent to which one's trying to secure an expanding movement politics and connecting movements together and then trying to link those with the most progressive forces politi possible in Britain at the moment for me uh, it is uh, to link with the possibilities of a Corbyn MacDonald government. Um, you don't have to be inside the Labour Party to do that but to be thinking about what is possible to try and beat back the endless attacks with the whole press uh, tries to throw at them to get them out, to get a centrist government uh, uh, back in Britain, which relates to the last question about um, how we can really possibly have any hope. If, that is, if that's all there is, if we are facing the end of the world, then let's keep dancing. Actually, dancing gets tiring. Dancing can get very tiring, and, and to feel meaningful and significant in the world you actually are likely to be able to do that more if you feel that you can engage in at least some meaningful and significant action, even if it's not going to work. That's what we do because we're hoping for something better, not just for ourselves, but for everybody. That, that is, I keep saying, is an empowering and energizing thing to attempt to do. Thank <coughs> you. We have time for the last round of questions, but... Uh, all men question in the last round. Ah, okay, there's a woman. So one here, then her, and then well. He had his hand up from the beginning. And you, okay. So let's start with that. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, maybe, uh, but I'm I'm here. But I'm going to ask, it was mentioned uh, during the presentation, uh, but uh, as you can hear, I'm not a native speaker. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry what I'm going to say. <laughs> but uh, it's for me, it's a bit, it's extremely difficult to listen for a uh, uh, text uh, like that. But, uh, and maybe I'm not the only one in the room uh, with that. Um, but so I'm what I'm I, I want I want to ask that uh, I'm um, uh, I like feminism I consider myself a feminist uh, but my question is that why we only speak about the women in the, in uh, when we speak about care work and and feminism uh, because um, you also mentioned in, in uh, answering one of the question that yeah we should reconsider care work and how we appreciate the care work uh, which yeah, which is done by by women but the women are forced to go to work and whatever but what we want isn't it that that the fathers and our partners can participate in in raising a child and that the fathers can um, mm, share uh, the same uh, uh, joy at, at home for as raising a child so shouldn't we speak about that what's the what's the that how the fathers don't have to work as much as well and and uh, so I don't know if uh, uh, you understand what I mean but then how we can we can uh, um, speak about uh, when we speak about feminism we speak about both women and and men and what's the role uh, in our society thanks I 
I very much appreciated that, that you referred uh, to Hannah Arendt, uh, who thought that uh, uh, collective uh, political uh, action uh, is like a second uh, birth, uh, and, and what gives uh, uh, and, and what makes uh, life uh, authentic. Uh, but she she also uh, stated that, that uh, um, this action is is so powerful. Uh, that it may uh, bring uh, uh, danger, uh, risk, and disillusion. And that's why in, in the history, the, the majority of people uh, refused uh, the, 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 the direct political uh, engagement. So my question is maybe uh, besides an education uh, um, to desires, uh, do we need uh, an education to risk uh, danger and above all uh, disillusion? I mean, uh, as there are urgency, it seems so people are yeah. raising questions. If Does you don't anyone mind, anyone else say, get a couple of others urgent yeah, exactly. to speak? Yeah, exactly. I would like, even yeah. if you don't address and yeah, respond okay, to that's everything, okay, yeah. at least that's we okay. have the, mm. this feeling mm. that is circulating. So there's one over there. Can you what? Wait. Lawrence. And then I will give. Um, well, f first of all, thank you for the for the really inspiring, lovely, and inspiring talk. Um, my question is just about the relationship between dystopia and, and utopia. Because I think we often tend to think that they're opposites. Um, and I'm, I wonder about your, your thoughts about the relationship uh, between the two. Even in some of the most bleak dystopias, there's usually, not always, but usually, glimmers of some sort of, of hope. And if we look at recent, some maybe since the 1970s in particular, recent critical dystopias and critical use utopias, they're mixtures, blends of dystopia and utopia. Like one of my favorite utopias, uh, Le Guin's The, uh, mm. the Dispossessed, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's both an anarchist utopia, an ambiguous one, but it's probably one of the most trenchant critics of anarchism and full of conflict and full of antagonism and division and uh, fighting of d dogma that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's my question about how you think about the relationship between the two. Are they always opposites or might we think of dystopias sometimes as like Sancho Panzo to, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, Don Quixote pulling utopia back down to earth perhaps? Thanks. Try to be short so we can collect more. That's Hi. Um, yeah, uh, the uh, feministic party in Sweden, um, Feministisk Initiativ, um, they which I hopefully, uh, which hopefully will get into Parliament uh, after the 9th of September. Um, uh, and um, and um, they have a slogan that is changing politics with uh, love as a driving force. So my question is, uh, if, then how do you see uh, love fitting into what you are, have been talking about? Okay. Well, all wonderful questions again. And I meant to mention Le Guin before, because um, practical utopias or <laughs> do usually talk about all the problems that are going to be involved. And to that extent, uh, the dystopic and utopic can often <coughs> be a part of each other. I think H.G. Wells in War of the World, world it's his utopias and dystopias are, <coughs> are coming together. You know, what those mad scientists often tried to do in producing uh, better worlds in many utopias always have their downsides in the construction of monstrosities like Frankenstein, <coughs> like Frankenstein's monster and so on. So you're right to uh, point out that. And also in terms of Love, actually I have two chapters on love in my book and I know that uh, in Amsterdam love and the probies and so on always uh, were uh, very significant in thinking about alternative futures and we went to Christiana today which of course was another attempt to create a utopia in the here and now based on love and peacefulness and so on and we all know the dystopias that entered that as uh, not just marijuana, but hard drugs come onto the scene. But, um, you know, what I would say, 
about love is, of course, love is the panacea of the capitalist imagination, you know, find, <coughs> find your prince or your princess and that's the end of the story. And so we have to rethink all the places where love is, you know, fortunately, uh, love can be found in many different ways and not just in political action with solidarity with comrades, but, you know, in love of animals and love of nature and the preservation and care of everything, all that is an aspect of love. So to talk about love, I think, is very important and, but, and to critique, you know, to create, critique our notions of romantic love, which are this, just this one-to-one -one and that's all there is and everyone, anyone not in a relationship can feel, um, you know, there's no hope of a good life for them. To go back to the first question, though, I wasn't sure if I followed it all, but one thing I should have emphasized, or I think I did mention, in all utopian thinking, shorter working time, shorter working day, that is paid working day, is crucial, and that's so that everybody can together be sharing um, <coughs> all aspects of life, whether caring or, or producing those commodities, which as we know now is to make money for the tiny 0.1% that are increasingly making money in, in, in the world at the moment. So, um, so ways of reorganizing daily life is, is crucial, I think, to <coughs> move outside of simply a feminist uh, perspective, if that's what you're referring to. And I have been quite concerned about that in thinking about the demand of wages for housework and thinking, well, that's not good enough at all because that simply takes caring work into the commodity market, it seems to me. And we want it out of the commodity. We want as much as possible out of the commodity market. If some people still have to... Um, uh, get terribly rich like Trump and build their gold towers. Um, uh, that's got nothing to do with what we want. And that would tie up with calls for a, 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 a universal basic income, problems with that. But somehow, you know, people having sufficient to exist on them, of course, that came into all the talk about money and alternative forms of money and so on last night, which I can't go into here. Um, <coughs> A rent and democratic engagement can be an illusion. Ah, well, yes, of course. Um, uh, and political education, just education, is everything. And, you know, beginning with, I think, facing the contradictions and paradoxes of everything we're doing and how difficult it is to sell to people because often we just make people feel guilty that, oh, well, you're just saying my life is wrong and you think you just think everything you're doing is right. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, you know, we just, we have to get more, try and have the most fluent tongues. We have to have, just all we can do is try and be as open as possible. But, but, but actually education, which, which itself has been so commodified of late. You know, in the 70s, actually how feminism spread was through WEA, Workers' Education Association and so on, where people could go to classes for nothing, more or less, or next to nothing. That's where I went to hear Sheila Robottom and Sally Alexander, and you know, they all become friends, and then we all start teaching. And, and if you think back, when I'm, that's why I mentioned Paris Commune, that the workers should become teachers, and, and you know, education is everything. But our notion of education, of course, isn't something <laughs> about giving degrees and getting that certificate, which is what they're trying, you know, that's what the commodification of education is. There's a huge expansion of London University where I work, where they're taking over endless buildings at the same time as closing down what used to be a part of the co actual college I worked in, Birkbeck. There's a pretense for outreach, but outreach is always to get people into university, get the throughput to get their degree, get them into the jobs, you know, and now people are being assessed, <coughs> our programs are being assessed on the outcome in terms of the job market. Well, that, as far as I'm concerned, got less than nothing to do with education. It's, it's to get <laughs> a more, under to understand the world better and understand how to live in the world better and <laughs> care for each other, which is... Um, Have I answered all the questions? I think I did. 
<laughs> Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> After this session, I'm still more convinced that uh, your work is very important for Thank us. Thank you. I'm really thanked. <coughs> and if you are also convinced, please clap on uh, this final session. Thanks. <laughs>